thank God for his presence here in this place. There's nothing like it, right? There's nothing like the presence of God. Um, The title of the message that the Lord has just put on my heart to share today is the disciples whom Jesus loves. Are you one of those disciples whom Jesus loves? If you are, then this message is for you. And we're going to be reading today from the book of John. So we're going to be going through a few chapters in the book of John. John chapter 6, some passages in John 15. So if you want to turn to John 15, and then we're going to go um, through a few different chapters after that. But I have a question for us today, or I have a question for you today. If you were, if you know you were going to die tomorrow, what would be the last thing you would say? Think about it. What would be the last thing you would say to your children? What would be the last thing you would say to your loved ones? What would be the last things that you would say if you knew God was going to call you home soon? So today we're going to be looking at the last moments or the last conversations of our Lord Jesus Christ before he was crucified. And we know that the whole word of God is God breathe. But it's interesting to know exactly what our Lord said and what he instructed to his disciples whom he loves before his crucifixion. Again, right, we can all agree that every single word is God breathed, it's life, it's important. But it's also important to take note, I was thinking what the Lord said before he went to the cross. What is those last words that he instructed his disciples before he went to the cross and before he went to be with the Father? And so, as I was reading through the book of John, there were some specific statements the Lord Jesus Christ said that stood out to me, and I'm going to share it with you today. And these statements the Lord didn't just say once, but he said three times, at least three times, specifically before or ahead of his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane and his crucifixion and death on the cross and his resurrection. And, you know, when the Lord, or when you reiterate something, it's something to take note of. Like, for example, when I teach my girls and I'm explaining a lesson to them in history, when I say, when I reiterate something, I'm trying to get them to fully understand, for it to stick with them, so that they remember that what I'm saying to you and what I'm reiterating to you, it's of real importance that I want it to go deep inside your heart and your soul. And so again, I was reading and meditating through these scriptures. I'm going to get there. The Holy Spirit began to impress these scriptures upon my heart. And he was giving these instructions again to his disciples at that time to instruct them, to encourage them, to exhort them, but also to warn them and prepare his disciples by way of reminder to his followers before his death and his resurrection. And it's not just for them, but it's for us today. And so what was this statement? What were these things that our Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples? He said, these things have I spoken to you. Before he went to the cross, at least three times he was saying to them, he gave them a teaching and he says, these things have I told you. These things have I spoken to you. Again, often when I'm teaching a particular subject, I find myself saying the same thing. These things, I'm explaining it to them. I'm telling you these things, girls. I'm telling you these things, my disciples, because I want you to remember this after I go back to the Father. I want you to hold on to this teaching and remember these words, these things that I'm telling you now. I want it to stick and I want you to remember it. The first one in John chapter 15 Verses 9 to 11. And we're going to be reading bits and pieces um, of the whole chapter for the sake of time. But John 15 verses 9 to 11. And the Lord says this to his disciples. As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 11, these things 
So at the end of what he was saying in chapter 15, he says, these things have I spoken to you. These things have I told you. He's basically summarizing, explaining, reiterating these things I have spoken to you. What? That my joy, my joy may remain in you. He told his disciples. So one of the first things or the last things that he said before he knew he was going to get arrested, before he knew he was going to get crucified and he was going to be separated from them physically, just physically, and he was going to ascend to the father. He said at the summary of John 15, the first things, these things have I spoken to you. I'm telling you these things. So what that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So the, one of the last things that the Lord Jesus Christ was instructing, reiterating, and wanted to, for his disciples to cling to, cleave to, remember, hold on to, remaining in him, remaining and abiding in his joy. Basically saying, or to summarize it, In today's language, these things I have spoken to you, I have told you these things, I'm telling you these things so that whatever may come, whatever you go through, whatever is about to take place, in every season, in season and out of season, when I ascend to my Father and I send the Comforter, I send the Holy Spirit, I have spoken to you all of these things and He is going to remind you of all the things that I have spoken to you. So that my joy, my joy may remain in you. So that you will experience, I have told you these things. So as I ascend, when I ascend to my father and you walk the way of the cross and you go through your Christian life, I'm giving you these words so that your joy may be full. So it would remain in you. So that you will experience and know my joy, speaking to his disciples, preparing them for their calling, preparing them to be able to stand, right? At the time of persecution, at the time of opposition. He says, not just to know his joy. He didn't say so that you would know my joy, but he said that it would remain in you, remain. And that not it would just remain this joy that he's talking about, that it would overflow, The joy, it says, for the joy, the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And what he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God, it's a deep abiding joy of the Lord Jesus Christ that he had in communion, in union with the Father. That caused him to endure the flogging. That caused him to endure the taunting and the mocking and the nails going through his hands. And the weight of the sin of the world upon him. This joy is beyond emotion. This joy of the Lord is our strength. This isn't emotion, this kind of joy. This isn't just emotion or temporary feelings that are dependent on present circumstances. Because there are many people today that can fake joy. Right? We have a smile outwardly, but inside we're discouraged and depressed. And when we're in a crowd, it's easy to fake joy. But when you go home, it's a different story. Inside... They're tormented. Inside there's emptiness. Inside they're lonely, lost, or broken. Some people even hide or mask the joy with medication or drugs. But that's only going to deal with the surface. To give them temporary feelings or emotions of joy. But the joy in Christ is a joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's a kind of joy that knows the will and heart of the Father. It's a joy of knowing Him and experiencing His awesome presence. It's a kind of joy that makes you stand in awe. A joy that makes you weep at the knowledge of His holy presence. It's a joy that makes you weep at the sight of His glory. A joy that comes when you are in unity, in the fellowship of the Spirit with your fellow believers. It's knowing His joy, and it's the joy of knowing Him. 
There's this worship song that's been ministering to me so deeply and it's taken from scripture where it says, come to me, right? All you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And one of the verses in the songs and it's a prayer and a cry or it's speaking about Jesus. It says, lift up your eyes. Speaking to the disciples whom Jesus loves, lift up your eyes, lift up your head, call to mind what he said. For he is joy and he is light. And when you seek him, you will find. And he says, I told you these things. I'm telling you these things now because he wants this joy of knowing him to remain in us. And not just remain, but we would overflow in the knowledge of this joy of of knowing him. So what are these things that he's saying here? He says, I have spoken these things to you that your joy may remain and that your joy may overflow. What are these things that our Lord Jesus Christ is referring to in this chapter, in this passage of scripture? These things he said, I have spoken to you or I have told you. What are these things he has spoken? John 15, in the beginning of this chapter, verses 1 to 10, verse 4. What does he say? Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of of itself except it what abides in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. Verse 5 he says that he is the vine. Right? If you're familiar with this passage. And we are the branches and he that abides in him or remains in him. Remember he says that my joy may remain in you. And he that remains or abides in him and he in us will bring forth much fruit. Without him, we can't do anything. Without him in ourselves, we cannot bear the spiritual life or the spiritual fruits. But if you abide or remain, speaking of intimacy, of relationship, of being in his presence and seeking him. And let his words, the word of God, remain and take roots and cling to and cleave to. He says, you shall ask what you will. Because if the word of God is abiding and remaining and rooted in your heart, you shall, you shall know what the will of the father is. You can know what the will of God is. You know what to pray because his words are deep in your heart and you you know his heart. And what he speaks through his word in you will remain. Remember Mary, it says what the angel told her, it said she hid these words. She hid the words in her heart. Even though she may not have really um, announced it publicly, but she clung to the words that was spoken to her. And then he goes on to say in verse 9, as the father loved me, so I have loved you. Continue, continue in this love of, that he has with the father. Continue, remain in this communion, remain and continue in this love with the same love that the father has for the son. Our Lord is saying for us to continue or remain or stay in this love, in this communion as he had with the Father. So if you notice, it's connected. The word of God or having the word of God remain in you, it's connected to remaining or guarding, keeping, obeying his commandments. It's the word of God alone. That will cause fruit to bear in the life and heart of a believer. And my prayers often this, Lord, give me a teachable spirit. Give me a heart, a teachable heart, right? Like, like Daniel. So whatever you teach, whatever you show, whatever you speak, Lord, my heart is saying, Lord, I'm listening. God, I'm open. Lord, I'm receptive to the work that you are trying to do, to what you're trying to say. So that you would bear fruit and you would be fruitful. And then when you begin to see, little by little, the fruit of Christ in your life, suddenly you find yourself more patient. Where before, you know, you, you know, if you ever drive in the city, it's stressful. Before, where you used to get stressed out, all of a sudden you have, you're enjoying the drive or you're patient. Where suddenly you have a greater love for others. Or how you have a desire to serve and honor and obey him. How you see a hunger in your heart to seek him. When you see the fruit little by little. How you don't have that weight of bitterness in your heart anymore. 
how you have a love and compassion for those who hurt you, for those who did you wrong or falsely accused you, how suddenly you have forgiveness where there is anger and, and there's love there. So when you start to see these fruits, when you start to see these changes, you know it's not something in yourself that you possibly could have done, right? To change that heart right? The heart of stone into a heart of flesh, into a moldable, teachable heart. How when you, when the Lord opens your eyes to see how the fruit that he's been building and pruning and working in your life, there's a joy in that. There's a joy unspeakable and full of glory where you can't help but say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body, right? He changed my mind. He set me free. He changed my heart. He gave me a love there where there was no love, where there was hatred. He gave me patience there where there is impatience. He gave me humility there where there was pride. Look what the Lord has done. And when you begin to see the fruit of his work in your life, there's that joy that comes from it. When he opens your eyes to see the fruit of what he is doing, what he is building, what he is working in your heart and the Lord is saying these things I have spoken to you all of these things about remaining and abiding in me my disciples all of these things I'm telling you about the key to spiritual um, fruitfulness right about having joy about that life being a fruitful branch let this remain in you Let my joy, because the joy is going to come from that place of abiding, of knowing him, of seeing him work, of seeing the hand of the gardener pruning in the heart of a believer, of seeing the gardener's hand and the gardener's touch in the mind and in your heart. And there's a joy there because you see that God is working. Even though it's painful, you see, and that's the joy of a believer, of disciples, to see Jesus. It's simply to see the hand of Jesus. It's simply to acknowledge and know the presence of Jesus is active, is working, is a reality in your life. And the Lord, the first thing he said, these things I have spoken to you, I'm telling you these things so that my joy may remain, not just stay there presently, but that you need this joy. For the things that are ahead, for the things that are to come, for the things that you are to face, because what happened to me, you will face the same on this side of eternity. And this is the key that you need to hold on to, that my joy, this joy of his presence, this joy of knowing him, as I said, it's not emotion, it's a knowledge of him, it's an awareness of his reality. Right? It's a joy because oftentimes we think of joy as just smiling and laughter. But oftentimes when I'm teaching the kids and we're having Bible study and the Spirit of God is moving on my heart, I start crying. And I have to remind the girls I'm not crying because I'm sad. But these are tears of joy because I feel the presence of God in our midst. So joy doesn't mean just laughter. Sometimes it's tears of joy. And I always have to tell them, and they know now, when mommy's crying, it's not because she's sad. It's not because I'm depressed. It's because I, when you feel and the awareness of the presence of God in your home, with your children, with your spouse, it's like you cannot help. I mean, that's how I react when I'm joyful. Tears of joy, of gladness, because you feel and you know the presence of God is in your, in this place. And this is the kind of joy he wants. He said, let it remain in you. And I pray, Lord, every day, Lord, let us acknowledge, let us just know your presence. Let this presence of your, of this joy of your presence remain. And he says, let it remain. And it remains by abiding and by knowing and by seeking and you will find. The second thing that the Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples whom he loves with an everlasting love. John chapter 16, verse 1. Again, he says, these things have I spoken to you. So the first one, he says, these things have I spoken to you so that my joy may remain in you, right? This joy, this abiding. Now in verse 1, he says, Now these things have I spoken to you that you should not be offended. So first he's talking about abiding and remaining in him. And this joy 
of his presence. And the second thing he's preparing his disciples for when he goes back to the father and what he wants to have them to stick in their hearts, right? For them to remember, I will, it's the second thing. He says, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be offended. In another translation, in the Christian Standard Bible, it says, I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. It's his love. He tells us these things because these things that he's saying in his word will keep us from being offended. When you bring it to memory, right? When you read and hold on to this word and let it go deep into your heart and you meditate it and you chew on it. He says in, in, in the CSB, it says, I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. Another translation, it says, these things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. So the things that he has spoken and his word, when the word is in our heart and we abide in his word, it says, it will keep you from stumbling. And the NIV, it says, I have to, uh, all this I have told you so that you will not, what, fall away. And these are his instructions because, you know, think about it. I was thinking, Lord, what is the last things that you instructed and taught your disciples? Right? The last things. Because think about the last things that you would say if the Lord was to call you home tomorrow. You know you want to tell them really think, important things that they will remember. Right? So the second thing that the Lord says is, I have spoken these things to you. These things I have told you. And we're going to hear or read about it. So what? It will keep you from stumbling. Keep you from falling away. And what does that word offended mean in the original language in the Greek? The Greek word is scandaliso. And it means a stumbling block on which another may trip or fall, right? When someone trips or falls, it means to entice to sin. It means um, when a person begins to distrust, a distrust and desert one whom he ought to trust and obey. It means to fall away. It means to be offended in one in the sense of, I see in another person, I see in what's happening, what I disprove of, and what hinders me from acknowledging his authority. It means to entrap or trip up. Also, in the definition, is apostasy and displeasure. So the second thing that the Lord was dealing with and wanted to settle in the hearts of his disciples before he was crucified and ascended in his resurrection power was this issue of being offended or stumbled or falling away in his disciples. And what's interesting to me and what came to my mind is the fact that the original Greek definition in the word offended also means to fall away. And in 2 Thessalonians, Paul warns the church, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, meaning the day of the Lord or tribulation or day of his wrath shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, speaking of the Antichrist. So Paul is saying in the last days, there is going to come a falling away first. And the definition of the word, one of the definitions of the word offended means falling away or apostasy, right? It's a disproval of what you see or what you hear and it's hindering us from acknowledging his authority. It's a distrust, a distrust and a desertment, a deserting of one, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we ought to trust and obey. So basically it's saying this, I have spoken these things to you, these things that we're about to go over. I have told you these things so that my words or what I will say when it comes to your remembrance, so that these words that I'm going to tell you, it's going to keep you. It's going to keep you from tripping up. It's going to keep you from falling away, from being enticed to sin. These things I'm telling you now will keep you from distrusting and deserting the one you ought to trust and obey, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Who, so you will be kept from and you won't be led or tempted to fall away. 
So you will be kept from dwelling and seeing in someone or another something you disprove of, and it will keep you from falling away or apostasy, so you won't dwell in it or give in to this displeasure that, will keep, that can cause you to fall away from him and his word. And so what are these things that the Lord spoke of to his followers so that they would not fall away, so that they would not give in to offendedness, so that they will not be offended in him and at him? Because remember, a lot of disciples stopped following him because they were offended at what he was saying. <clears throat> And so Jesus is saying here in 16 and the verses before 16 and through chapter 16, he's telling, I'm telling you these things so you will not be offended when these things happen. When things to come, I'm already preparing you now, right? I'm giving you the heads up. I'm I'm telling you these things so this word will settle in your heart. So when the time comes, you will remember what I told you and you will not be enticed to fall away from me, to disprove of what I'm saying. So you won't be enticed of this displeasure that the enemy wants to um, take root in your heart and separate you from this abiding remaining love. What is it? John 15, 18 to 20. The Lord says, these are the verses before the Lord said that. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, if you would lo- it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of this world. This is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. Oftentimes we forget that, right? We forget that, that the servant is not greater than his master. We forget that, you know, that we will go through the, what, the things that the Lord went through. That we will experience suffering and trials also. That we will be persecuted also. That we will be opposed also, right? That we will be attacked also. That we will be rejected also. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours. So what are these things that he's saying to them? These things I have spoken to you so you will not be offended. You will not allow this to hinder you. You will not fall away. You will not give in to this displeasure. You are going to be persecuted, he's saying. He's already preparing them. I'm telling you now. You're going to encounter persecution. You're going to encounter opposition. This is the way of the cross. You're going to encounter rejection. You're going to encounter hatred. The world is not going to like you. You will feel lonely. Jesus is saying that this road and the way of the cross, the way of the cross, I've read somewhere, the way of the cross will lead to glory. Right? The way of the cross leads to glory. But the road or the way or the road of the cross is not a glory road. Right? Can I say that again? The way of the cross will lead to glory. Leads to glory. But the way on this side of eternity or the road of the cross is not a glory road. And that's the mistake that we forget. And we forget what the Lord said here. That's why he's telling his disciples, remember these things. Because the road, like Pastor Alex shared yesterday at the Bible study, is about the way of the cross. It's not a glory road. And we've been duped into thinking that it is a glory road by false teachings and false prophets. But it's not a glory road. It's a road marked with suffering. It's a road marked with rejection. But the thing is, he says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, the joy that was set before him. He saw the joy set before him. Jesus warned them of coming opposition because he did not want them to get surprised or be made cause to stumble or be offended at the opposition. You will be rejected. We're going to be pruned. 
The Holy Spirit will deal and expose areas in our hearts to build us up, to purify us, to make us more into His image, that we would reflect His glory and His life and His light here on earth. But the cross is not a glory road to the flesh, right? Jesus is saying these things, is not saying these things may happen, but these things will happen, he told his disciples, before he was arrested, before he died, and before he was resurrected. If you truly desire to follow me and walk with me, he says, expect these things. The Christian walk isn't for the faint in heart, but the beauty of it is that the Spirit of God who dwells inside of you will renew, will strengthen, and give you a new heart. Jesus also warned them, what are these things? He spoke so that they would not be offended or fall away or fall into apostasy or depart. He says they're going to put you out of the synagogues. You're going to get kicked out. You're going to be rejected. Synagogues means those who profess God, right? Who worship in the temple. So the Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples, you are going to be rejected by those who profess to know me. They will put you out of the synagogues. Instead of receiving the word, they're going to put you out. They're going to push you out. That's why sometimes, I don't know if you hear of churches where the board or the members, they don't like what the pastor is saying, so they push out pastors, right? And they vote a new one in because... That pastor tells them what they want to hear. I've heard of those situations. So the Lord is telling his disciples, I'm telling you these things now. So when these things come, you won't depart from me. You will press in. You will continue in the road and the path that I have called you to. These things they will do unto you. He says, they will do these things unto you. He said to his disciples, because they have not known the father. They don't truly know my heart. They don't really truly know the heart of the Father. But these things have I told you. So what? When the time comes, when the time shall come, you will remember. You may remember what I told you. Again, reiterating these truths. Reiterating this fact because it's important. He was preparing them for their walk and the rest of their lives when he went to be with the Father. He was preparing them. And I've told you these things, so these things you can remember. So when these things happen, you won't forget. And these things I said unto you at the beginning because I was with you. And then he says in verse 5 of chapter 16, But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you ask me whither thou goest, whither goest thou. But because I've said these things to you, so the Lord is telling these things to his disciples, you're going to get rejected, you're going to get kicked out of the synagogues, right? You're going to be persecuted. And it says, sorrow has filled your heart. Why did sorrow fill their heart? Because they had their own expectations of what the kingdom of Christ will look like and be like. That it would happen there at that present moment. That Rome would be overthrown. That they would conquer, right? That they would overthrow the Roman Empire. That Jesus would reign at that generation at that time and so likewise we also have expectations and the Lord was speaking these things to his disciples so they won't have wrong expectations of how the Christian walk can be and what the Christian walk can be like because the expectations that they have was that the kingdom of God would be manifested there and now that they would see the Roman Empire overthrown there and now Likewise, we also have expectations, right, of how our lives should pan out, how we should be treated, how things would end up. I never expected to go through cancer at a young age. Expectations of how God would answer. And then what happens when these expectations aren't met? When things go the opposite of what we expected, or what is said is the opposite of what we wanted to hear, when we're caught off guard. So there's this nature in the heart of man to be offended, and even in the disciples, we see it, right? These are the apostles of the church, the same heart. 
And the Lord is telling them, I'm telling you now. I'm preparing you now. I'm giving you these words now. So you would remember. So when that trial comes, when that moment comes, you would remember and call out, Jesus, give me the grace, right? Help me to overcome this. Lord, give me a heart of humility. Help me to receive when we remember what he says. The last thing in John 16, 33, when Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you, what is the last thing? I mean, maybe there's more, right? I think there's more, but the last thing I want to share today of what the Lord Jesus Christ instructed and said to his disciples before he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, John 16, 33. Again, he says, these things I have spoken to you, these things I'm telling you, reiterating to you. Again, I always say it to the girls, girls, I'm telling you this because. You know, I'm not trying to sound like a broken record, but this is of importance. That in me, you may have peace. In the world, you, in me, you might have peace, it says. That in me, ye might have peace. In the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so tribulation means here, you shall have affliction. You shall have trouble, he says. Persecution, burdened. It means a pressing together. You will feel pressed. You shall have at times where you're feeling pressed. Like, I don't know if you ever felt like you were being squeezed, right? You, you feel like you're being squeezed in that olive press. It's just like everything around you is just squeezing you. A pressing together or feeling pressure. And now in John 16... Jesus is now summarizing what he had just spoken to his disciples and gives the reason or explanation why. Why they should hold fast these things I have spoken to you, telling them the purpose of it and for it, so that why in him we may have peace. I told you these things. The last things he's saying, in me you may have peace. I've told you all of these things, all of the teachings, John 15, 16. So what? You will have peace. Not a temporary peace. It's a peace from the king that anchors us in the storm. In me, you might have peace. In me, you might have peace. It's a peace in him that surpasses all understanding. It's a peace that endures and overcomes in the midst, even in the midst of anguish, even in the midst of grief, even in the midst of sorrows, of trials and tribulations. You know, um, I often give my kids as an example because that's my life throughout the the week. But I've been teaching the girls, you know, we've been studying the Roman Empire ancient Roman Empire, and you know, they're learning about the things that the empire built, right? The aqueducts, the Colosseum, and all of these things back then that we use today, right? The Roman Empire. But then, you know, the Lord always reminds me to use these things as a teaching moment. So I was sharing with them, you see this Colosseum, right, that they built? Because there's this picture of the Roman Colosseum. And that Colosseum, that's where Christians were eaten alive by wild animals, You know, it's in the Colosseum where Christians, early, the early church was eaten alive by lions, I told them. You know, where they were burned at the stake. But at the same time, I told them, but yet, but yet they stood firm in their faith. But yet, even in the midst, they had peace, I told them. They weren't afraid. It's this kind of peace that the Lord is saying, let this peace remain in you. A peace that, you know, it doesn't mean the troubles are not there, but you're standing anchored and firm in the midst of the troubles. A peace that gives you boldness to stand and face lions. To face these persecutions. It's a peace even in the most difficult circumstances. Jesus was speaking to them, to his disciples whom he loves, and offering them peace. Then, 
right now, before I go to the cross, before you guys are all scattered, before you witness me being arrested, before you witness and see that I'm being flogged and crucified, I'm giving you this peace now. I'm offering it and I'm telling you, take, take hold of this peace that I'm offering it to you now. You know, it's easy to talk about peace when everything is okay in our life, right? It's easy for someone to, to talk about peace, realistically speaking, right? I'm not trying to point fingers or condemn. But it's easy for us to talk about peace when everything is fine and dandy, right? When you're on the mountaintop, when everything is going great. But for me, I like to hear And my ear goes towards those who have been through the fires, who talk about peace, but they've been through fires, even worse than mine, who have been through trials so deep and have the battle scars to prove it. And when they talk about peace, my ear goes up, right? Because they walk through fires and they're talking about peace. Because it's easy for us to say peace, peace, when everything's at peace. But it's another thing to really know the peace of God in the midst of the affliction. In the midst when everything is going wrong. In the darkest valleys, when they speak about the peace of God and seeing the peace of God. My ear really bends to I want to hear, I want to listen to that testimony. Here our Lord Jesus Christ is about to be betrayed. He is about to be arrested in the garden and tortured, beaten, spit upon, crucified, and died the most horrific death. And here he is offering his disciples this peace. This peace we can find in him. He says you might have peace. Because Christians, some Christians, you're a Christian and profess, but you don't have peace. Because that peace is found in abiding in him and in his word. Not everyone has peace, those who profess him. But we have and we can have. That's why he says, so that you may or that you might have this peace by abiding in him. If you seek me, right? If you seek me, you shall find me. If you search for me with all of your heart, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest Romans 8, 1, having been justifi- justified by faith, we have peace with God through, through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, in me, you might have peace if you're in me, abiding in me. But then at the same time, he says, you will or you shall have tribulation. So there's an offering of peace through him, and yet there is a promise that his disciples will encounter trials and tribulations as he did. In a believer in Christ, it's possible to have peace in the midst of trials, peace in the midst of storms that are going on around us. And I share this not to boast in myself, but I asked myself, because I'm like, I know, Lord, this was really you. How did I have peace while I was sitting there going through in a chemo chair? When the red devil, they called it the red devil, was going through my veins. How did I have peace? And I was laughing. How did I have peace when you're going through chemo? How do people have peace when they go through the loss of a loved one? I ask, Lord, how was I able to worship at the very moment my dad stepped foot into glory? How were you able to have peace at the same time your heart is broken and shattered into a billion pieces? Yet worshiping the Holy Spirit. Saying, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. That's peace. True peace in Jesus Christ. It's not void 
of trials. It's not void of opposition. It's not void of all these things. It's a peace that alone comes from the very presence of God, where even if your heart is broken, you're saying, Lord, come live in me all my days. Take over. Take over this minute. Take over this moment. You are welcome in this place of brokenness. You are welcome in this affliction, my God. This is the peace in Jesus Christ. It's not void of affliction. It's not void of grief, but it's the ability. It's really, there's a peace that guards you and keeps you in the midst of a heart that's broken and shattered into a billion pieces that you can worship with all of your heart saying, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. I welcome you in this place. I welcome you here. I welcome you at this moment. I welcome you. I welcome you in this trial. I welcome you in my offendedness. I welcome you in this place. A peace that guards, a peace that surpasses all understanding. How? How, I ask myself. I don't know, because I, I mean, I say it, but I know. I'm like, I, don't really, I really don't know how I went through that. How? It's him. It says, he shall be called wonderful. It's he who is wonderful. He shall be called wonderful. He shall be called counselor. Because at that very moment, when you call upon his name, he will counsel you. Can I tell you a testimony? The next day, when my mom was being rushed to the hospital on an ambulance, fear came in my heart. I'm like, Lord, you're going to take both of my parents in the same week? I'm like, Lord... Because her oxygen levels were really low the next day, literally the next day. And she was being rushed by ambulance. And I was like, Lord, I was reading the word and I'm like, Lord, you're going to take, just tell me, Lord, you know, you're going to take both of them. And the Lord very clearly, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Peace, remaining, abiding. In the midst of the most horrific circumstances, you hear his word. <laughs> he's clearly, he's like, don't worry, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I, I will come to you. He says, I will come to you. And in that moment when you call upon his name, he came. Wonderful counselor, mighty God in the midst of everything, mighty God. Mighty God yesterday, today, and forever, you are our mighty God. And what the everlasting Father and our Prince of Peace. I'm going to close with this example. In John chapter 18. Now, this is after the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was arrested, right? Arrested by Roman guards and soldiers. He was betrayed by Judas. In verse 12. It says, then the detachment of troops and the captain and officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And it says in verse 15, and Simon Peter followed Jesus. And it says, so did another disciple, or another translation says, so did the other disciple... So Jesus is being led by a, a, a group of Roman guards, right? This is, a, I mean, I remember one time, Matt, Matt, we were actually coming from church or somewhere. Um, police, for no reason, police stopped us and they surrounded him. Like seven, eight cops literally went in a circle and surrounded him, right? And it was like a, they got the wrong person. But they surrounded him. And I was scared at that moment when you have all these, like, you know. So I can imagine what they were feeling at that time when Roman guards surrounded Jesus. Because at that moment, it's not even really the full moment of what our Lord went through. But I was scared, you know. And the, an officer was like, you know, he was like trembling, like in anger. It was like, and he was like telling me, no, you, don't you dare go near. 
because I wanted to know what's going on. So I remember that feeling of fear and intimidation when you have all of these guards surrounding you. So this is what our Lord was going through here at the Garden of Gethsemane. He was arrested by the Roman guards, right? The officials were there. But it says, Simon Peter... At this time of great pressure, at this time of great fear, in this time of great intimidation, a scary moment, the king of the world, the Messiah, the son of God, is being led away as a criminal. And you're, the disciples are there, right? Peter, and yet Peter and John followed him. At that moment, it's scary because, you, you know, you could, would you follow when you see like a Roman officials? coming at you like you're about to be arrested. But it says, Simon Peter followed Jesus. And it says, the other disciple did also. And it says, that disciple was known by the high priest. And that disciple, and it doesn't name who this disciple is. But oftentimes in the book of John, John references himself as an unknown disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loves. He didn't name his name when he's referring to himself in John. So some Bible commentators and teachers speculate that this could be referring to John or, um, or Nicodemus or someone. But many speculate that it's John. But anyway, it says this other disciple went with Jesus in the courtyard of the high priest. And then Peter just, he stood on the door side, right? He stood outside and he was warming his hands by the fire with the Roman guards. Peter was seeking comfort in this fire, in the fire of the Romans. He sought comfort in the Romans' fire. He sought warmth with the enemy's fire. But yet this other disciple went in with him. In this moment of intimidation, at this moment of trial, right, when they're accusing our Lord and they arrested him, there was a disciple that stood with him there. And then we also see at the foot of the cross, the disciple whom Jesus loves was there with his mother at the foot of the cross. Think about seeing that, you know. That's, that's a pretty devastating thing to see for lack of a better word. But there was a disciple who stood with Jesus when he was being um, accused and questioned by these high priests. And there was a disciple who stood with him at the foot of the cross. And my prayer is this, Lord, I want to be like that disciple. I want to be like the disciple that stands with you. I want to be like the disciple that stands by your side no matter what. No matter how hard it is at the cross, if you lead us to the cross, I want to be that disciple that's by your side, at your feet. I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to condemn Peter, but I don't want to just be on the outside of that room warming the fire and the fires and the comfort of the world where it's safe and it's comfortable. I want to be the disciple that's by your side no matter what. But praise God, because even in Peter's failure, you see when the Holy Spirit came upon them, we see what happened in the life of Peter. When the Spirit comes upon you and he changed his heart, what happened? At the end of his life, he was no longer that disciple was on the outside. He was no longer the disciple that was warming himself by the fires of the world, seeking comfort, seeking safety outside of the cross. That's what it is. It's seeking comfort and safety outside of the cross. He was no longer that person because the Holy Spirit came upon him. And the Holy Spirit and the Word of God changed him. And then what did he say when he was being martyred in Rome? He says, I am not worthy to be crucified as my Lord. Crucify me upside down. Look how the Lord changed him. The disciples whom Jesus loves. So Peter went from this place of finding security and safety and comfort outside of the way of the cross. But yet when the spirit came upon him and strengthened him in the book of Acts, he was a new Peter. He was a new man and he no longer sought out the, the comfort of the, the fires of the Rome. He didn't seek the warmth of Rome. He says, Lord, I'm not, cruci I'm not worthy to be crucified like you are. I'm unworthy. And he was crucified upside down. 
see what the Lord can do. The disciples whom he loves, he is able, whether you're the disciple who's inside the court with him or you're standing outside in this time of trial and affliction or whatever is happening. My prayer is just the Lord make us like this disciple. Make me like this disciple. Just always standing with you. I want to stand. I want to be by the cross. I want to see. I want to be there. I want to be by your side. I want to feel your presence every day. And the Lord is saying to his disciples, before this moment happened, before this great trial that they were about to go through, before they all fled, except for a job, right? But praise God, he restored them. So you see, he's the God of second chances and restoration. But remember, these words that the Lord told them, they, I, without a shadow of my doubt, they remembered and held fast to these words that he has spoken for the rest of their lives. Because they went to the four corners of the earth, and most of them, except for one, was martyred for the faith. They endured to the end. Because what? He says, remember these things, these things I have spoken to you. In closing, what? Remain, abide in my joy. Guard your heart and remember these things so you won't be offended at the way of the cross. You won't be offended or be tempted to fall away or step away when you see things don't go as you expected. When you get kicked out of the synagogues, right? When you get persecuted, when you get rejected, when you're lonely. And then lastly, his peace. So in me, you may have peace. You will have troubles. But he says, what? I have overcome the world. He has overcome the world. Lord, that's my prayer. Lord, I want to be like that disciple. I want to be where you are today. And help me, Lord, be in this place of remaining. He says, this joy, that your joy may be full. Many, some people may have lost this joy. This joy that I was describing beyond emotion or this peace that we need that goes beyond our circumstances beyond our afflictions it's a peace it's a joy and a peace that makes you stand in awe it makes me fall to my face and worship and he's like I want these things to remain to abide to overflow in you today and every day Lord may it be so May it be so, my God. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for your instructions that you have spoken these things, not just to your disciples, Lord Jesus, back then, but Lord, you're speaking them to us today. These things you said, I have spoken to you so that in me, your joy may remain and be full, that in you, we would have peace. In you, God, Lord, we will not be offended. We will not fall away, but you are able to keep us in perfect peace whose minds are stayed upon you, my God. Lord, I want to be like that disciple, Lord. And I thank you, Jesus. Like Peter, you restored. And you restored him in such a way that he was faithful until the end. Lord God, renew strength. Fill joy, Lord. A true joy, this joy that you experienced, this joy that you saw when you were going to the cross, Lord God. It's a different joy. It's a deep joy, God. And I pray that we as your church today may experience this and that it would overflow in us today, my God. And to have peace that surpasses all understanding, that it's available. Thank you. Thank you so much that it's available for us today. Thank you that you made a way where there is no way that we can call upon your name and we can come before your presence. Lord, and we ask, Lord God, in your name. And you said it shall be given to us according to your will. So we simply come before you, Lord. Make us this way. Make us like this disciple, Lord God. Lord, a faithful heart. Lord, that stands by your side at the foot of the cross no matter what. And I thank you that your spirit is able and willing to do that in our lives. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.